but this is once again one of these Sankitana shlokas. Uh, because here yeah, Ajahn is planning his way back home, back to Godhead. And uh, as we heard yesterday in a lecture, uh, there are different stages of advancement. Since we speak yesterday, I think yesterday's lecture should be recorded yesterday. Yesterday mm -hmm. lecture is recorded, right? I am going around here and telling everybody they should just study the lecture back and forth, piece by piece. Sure. This is a concentrated manual how to situate oneself properly, how to go back home, back to the right? These two things have to go simultaneously. And they should, logically spoken, they should go together. Because if you are not well situated, like we are all like on the boat crossing the ocean of material miseries, if you are not well situated on the boat, you are running from one side to another, uh, trying to find a place to sit, and you think, ah, I should sit in front, or maybe I should sit in the back, and, and maybe, no, actually, mm, and the boat is already rock, rocking by the waves of the ocean, by the storms, very likely we just fall overboard, that's all. So it's very important when it's well situated, probably with some safety belt, because the boat is rocking. It's not a smooth ride to cross the ocean of material miseries. As we evolve through different stages of life, uh, it gets even more rocking. You know, in the beginning when you are young, you can take the rocking mechanism very quite of more easily because your body just goes along with that, you get smashed on that side of the boat, and then you just go smashed on the other side. When you get older, the body is not so elastic, you can get simply more disturbed. You can get simply really more agitated if you are not properly situated. So our agitation should not increase, it should decrease. And that's of course only possible by acquiring proper knowledge, and knowledge automatically includes that one is properly situated. If, you are, if I don't know who I am, that's already bad. But I may know who I am, but I don't know where I am. I may know you now, that's me, yeah, okay, but where I am now? So if one is not properly situated, then uh, there is no time really to, 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 to act according to one's own original spiritual nature. One will be constantly, you know, in a state of confusion, trying to get some grip, you know, so I can be situated. So, then there is others who just say, no, let's, let's forget to think who we are, let's just be situated. You know, they always look for the chair to sit on, to be properly situated, but they don't know uh, what's the meaning of those things, to be properly situated. So actually this is all different lack of Krishna consciousness because these things logically should go automatically. It's like Prabhupada said, when you are illuminated, the sun is rising, then you don't see just the sun. You automatically also see things around you because there is light. But when you are in a darkness or there is some glimmer, then trouble comes. You think, oh, I see some glimmer, I'm illuminated. But you don't even know where you are sitting. So, you know, so both things have to be done simultaneously. So here Jamil is uh, introducing Sankirtan. That's actually what I guess he's just saying here, that I will now not think just about myself and how to be so, how to be safe. No, actually I will become a well-wishing friend of others. Because this is what the association of female brings, selfishness. Even material is both. And you see, before the men get married, or before they get really strongly affiliated with the females, they are usually more open, of course, I don't know in Scandinavia, but generally, you know, in a human society, people are more, you know, the men are just more, because they, you know, nobody wants to be alone, so they usually men are just students, let's say, you know, they just hang out together. This has nothing to do with spiritual life, but they just hang out together. And they are even friends, what they call friends, you know, they share sense gratification together. But as soon as the female comes in, the whole show is changing. And what does the female finally do? They congregate on a completely different level. They congregate simply to boast with the assets they collected. 
they want to share, like women like to come together and talk bad about men, you know, to someone in a habit. It's very uncultured, Any culture doesn't facilitate such exchanges really, because there is education going on, don't do that. But they like to do that. Why? Because, hey, this is my chair, I collect with my chair, and this is my property, and look, they are always competing. How did you, how did you get him? How did you park him like this? In other words, how did you separate him? So if there would be, a, there is always this illusory image that females and children, and that they bring people together in one big family. In this. No, it's exactly opposite. It's how the hippie movement fell apart. The hippie movement fell apart because of drugs and sex. That's all. You know, so because uh, they were going, they were thinking sex brings us together. No, it's exactly opposite. The, 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 because the, the, the interest in one's own sensuality becomes so strong, you stop, you become very cruel. It's actually, cruelty is a result of lust. Like demons can be very cruel because they are just lustfully motivated to satisfy themselves only. They can look charitable, but for only for their own purposes. So one of our previous GBC used to say, yes, females look very merciful and very accommodating as long as it suits their purposes. Sorry, I don't want to offend any matages. There are actually exceptions, yes, but that is coming only from a superior spiritual knowledge. It's not coming by the genetic design. So genetic design is always mine and yours. They segregate society. This is mine and this is yours. This is ours and this is yours. Activity just saw when Swami said, just see a female concern about uh, the uh, humanity by looking in the history of mankind. How many women you find really out there making revolutions? How many female real revolutionaries you find? The only female revolution is, and I'm coming from a terroristic generation, and there were women involved, fierce terrorists. And the story was always the same. They were in love with the chief terrorist, who was not a woman, he was a man. It's always the same story. They fall in love with the chief terrorist, and this way they look like very terroristic and idealistic. And, but it's only because that man, but, as Bhaktivedya Punasami points out, they will become fiercely terroristic and fiercely violent and defensive when the war comes to their home backyard. In other words, don't cross my fence. This is my house, my territory. This is a very small thing, but that's where they start to fight. That's, that's where they become fierce. Don't cross this territory. This is now mine. But otherwise, if it's a, poor, a capitalistic uh, government, a communistic government, and, you know, women are always in all societies, or some savage government, or some ulu ulu zulu, you know, government, it doesn't matter. They always create immediately their social field. I experienced it in the communism. There was, a, <laughs> there was not much to get, you know. You couldn't go anywhere and you couldn't buy anything. That's the, it was the essence of communism. So, <laughs> but even in that society, the females create a fierce competition between the men, who is more the leading party member, and who is more advanced communist. And they were all, uh, they were all creating always this kind of upper class and uh, low class. You know, always was there. Even there was really not much to get. You know, and they were going, no, we go to holiday to uh, this part of the forest. No, we were in holiday in that part of the forest. It was only one forest, you could go to holiday. You know, it was a small country. You could hardly cross the borders. Nothing. You couldn't go anywhere, not do nothing. No, no, even then the competition was very fierce. Now it's completely out of control. Now the females just compete, you know, about the latest shavikus to be smeared into the face or you know, the latest technology, and this iPhone, and this and this and this and that. that. Because in the female department, they are fiercely socially aware. How do they look like? How do the other people, what do the other people say about this? 
Therefore, they are always aiming for a man who has a financial means to become socially prominent. That's the real endangered species. They always aim for that. You know, when you are somebody in any kind of society, it could be a cannibalistic society, they will immediately flock around me. He is the one who can eat, you know, most neighbors. Mm. You know, that's a good man. You know, they immediately, besides that there is a genetic instinct built in there to go for a fear, fertile male to get a good progeny, because the progeny department is there. Once the progeny is there, the man can go on holiday. Bye-bye. You know? <laughs> The men are just financially securing inseminators. That's the naked face of material energy. <laughs> Sounds quite heavy, isn't it? <laughs> try it out. Go ahead. It's called Brihasta Ashram. Go ahead. Have a good try. And show me an exception where it doesn't work like this. And I'm bowing down deeply to these Matajis who don't act upon their nature because they are all like that. It's just some act upon it, some don't. And those who don't, they will tell you, I heard this. I can be very bold in my speech because I get it from the Matajis, not from the men. Men are stupid. They don't understand one thing. They always go, very nice Mataji, very humble Mataji. Mm, look, humble. They can bow down, they can meditate about Krishna and hunt the next Brahmachari down simultaneously. No problem. This is a, they have a 360 degree vision. Tarada is known all the time. They know exactly which man is standing behind them. They enter the room here. They know how many males are there. They know that. They can immediately evaluate which one is small together, which one is less together. You know. Of course, when they fall in love, <laughs> the lust takes over so badly they don't always see one sink. Very, very get cheated when you are lusted. So this is how this material nature works. And this is what the Jarmal says, bye bye. And I, I had enough of this. I had my taste. And now I understand, although when Prabhupada always says this word, uh, when he said that we shouldn't become like dancing dogs. You say, well, where did you get that from? You know, I, never saw, I never saw a dancing dog, you know. Uh, maybe in a circus or what? No, actually, Bhagavatam says this here, Ajahnul says, and it goes like a dancing dog. You can make a dog dance by having some eatable and holding it up. You know, maybe some little dog. Big dogs generally don't do this. They just sit in front of you and stare at you like they want to hypnotize you. You know, they can become so intense because dogs are one of the few creatures whose consciousness is so advanced it comes really through the eyes. If you look in the eyes of a snake, you don't see anything. Or in the eyes of a mouse, you don't see anything. But if you look in the eyes of a dog, because the consciousness is quite high already, well, you will get an expression. And they can really look in your eyes like, you wouldn't do this. You wouldn't eat and not give me anything. You get almost guilty when you eat, you know. When, you, when, you, when a dog is staring at you, you eat, you get such a feeling of guilt. Poor dog, you know, he's so hungry. No, he's not hungry. He's just envious. What are you eating? That's all. And you must give him a piece of food and then he stares again. You know, <laughs> until you go, you know, shut up and get lost. Okay, okay. I'm going now. <laughs> I don't want to give a lecture on dogs, but they are very human in many regards. They are just more honest. They just do it. Like children, they are also like dogs. When you eat something, they stare at you. And they just go, hey, what are you eating? I want to have also eating my meal. I want to also have this. You know, <laughs> when the Vedic ceremonies, uh, when the Maha was distributed after the offering, the first one who were fed was Brahmanas. That's the spiritual part. And then women and dogs and children. Because if you don't do that, if you eat before them, they will just stare at you and there will be envy, there will be envy going around. So to not to pollute the atmosphere, <laughs> they were like first fed, they are now that they're okay and now we can eat peacefully. As a matter of fact, that there are Brahmanas who just don't like to eat the others together. 
because around food there is so much envy coming up. And it's, uh, it's very un very unpolite. You know, it's like to stay on somebody's food <laughs> in any way it ruins the whole meal. <laughs> I know that in Czech they have a culture where they invite guests, serve them food, and they complain they ate too much. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's the Czech culture. You invite somebody, you feed him, and when he left, they go full blast. Look what they were eating, they ate everything away, and, and you speak only badly about the guests. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is Mexican culture. <laughs> so Ajahn is making a very clear statements here, opening his way back home, back to Dhania, his path back home, back to Dhania. It is not, we are not the anti-woman movement, come on, otherwise we wouldn't have even mother just coming around. No, we, we see them simply as the carriers, you can also turn it easily around, for women is the same regarding men. We see them as the carriers of delusion. You don't hate the man, you hate the disease. <laughs> They are disseminating this sensuality all the time. Now the very culture is training a man to be restricted, that's all. It's there. As Krishna asks, you know, confidentially, Maharaj Yudhisthira, I mean, your mother got this blessing, she never grows old, she's young. You know, this was really quite bizarre because there was this young, you know, Pandavas, you know, power, Kshatriyas, you know, beautiful looking and the mother looked like uh, almost dead taller. She was even younger as them, because she got the blessing, she was like, oh. So it looks kind of strange, you know. And uh, naturally, when you have a certain shape of the body, it provokes a certain impulse. It's, it's going to be there, one way or another. You know, so for like example, being a father is an interesting experience. Because you have this baby, you know, and you wash the body of the baby and, and you know, and so you get all the anatomical studies automatically because it's passing stool and everything, you have to wash it all off and, and it's just a little bundle of joy as they call it, you know, yeah? But the bundle of joy is growing. There's a definitely a point where you realize I'm not a father, I'm a man. So therefore it's, Chinaka Pandit says, don't be really alone, even with you, Tore, and even with the mother. You know, it's a warning there. Why he doesn't mention it? Because why is, you know, why is the regulative, the regulation chain? But uh, Tore and even the mother, that's very amazing. Oh, material energy can be so powerful. Tore, definitely. On a certain point, you don't have a toy, it's a young girl. <laughs> and very quickly developed. Very quickly. It goes just like that. Suddenly the bundle of joy just stands and looks at you and you realize, hmm, of course, normal father, you know, always keeps the fatherly feeling is dominated. You know, and toddlers have that habit. <laughs> they sit on the lap of the father even when they are 20 years old. <laughs> you know, Papa, you know, <laughs> and then they sit and say, you, could, you could have 20 years old girl sitting on your lap. I was always wondering as a Kami, uh, even as a Kami, how do they do that? You know, how do you have that kind of relationship without no sex love? What is this? You know, there's no sexual impulse. No, actually, originally there is no sexual impulse. It's your daughter, that's it. You know, there is, there is no sexual impulse, but it can. You see on nature, illusion can go easy, especially when a man is completely uncontrolled, untrained. You know, the whole thing can get completely out of control. So that which Nyakapanda is warning, they are simply made like this. And it doesn't stop with you to order. It doesn't stop like this. It's the shape, it's a combined sound, shape, uh, form, uh, then uh, smell even, and they are nicely perfumed. Because women are usually more clean as men. <laughs> you know, yeah. You go in a shop, shop, right? You know, and the smell that comes. You know, and ladies usually very, very in communist countries, that's another thing. They very stink. But 
but you know, but uh, you know, in a, you know, in the West usually, you know, they 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 don't you know they are very you know they don't man you know some worker comes and buys some bunch of beer you know and he just is really character and just thinks all over the shop you know just men are you know ooh <laughs> it's just more like Renault sort of you know <laughs> it's like so the form is there the sound is there the smell is there and the sense is gone therefore when Krishna asked Maharaj you still have you have such a young beautiful sweet smelling mother can't you sometimes attract it? And Maharaj Yudhisthira being the embodiment of truth said to me, yeah, I am attracted. And then Krishna said, so what are you going to do? What, what are you doing about it? And Maharaj Yudhisthira said, nothing. You know, so nothing in Krishna consciousness means you chant Hare Krishna, you are absorbed in devotional service. As we heard yesterday, it's the ultimate only possible sense control we have. We are not yogis. You know, we are not. Like Bhagavad Gita gives an example of a sense control in the form of a tortoise, that the senses go out and then we pull them in again. Yeah. In the West, we have too many mad tortoises running around. The senses come out and then you cannot pull it in again. <laughs> <laughs> the tortoise is on the run. <laughs> because there's no control, it's not training. You know, there's no education. So an example is difficult to apply in the West. You have to be like the tortoise. When the sense is gone, you have to withdraw them again. <laughs> <You know? clears throat> How do you do this? <laughs> when you have the whole life running around like crazy for next sense object. <laughs> So, but that's very practical for us, is, as you run.